welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I am Shriya. In today's episode, we talk about women's rights taking center stage in the ongoing movement against pension reforms in France, where trade unions organized an all-out strike on March 7 and 8. Next up, a Canada district school board in Toronto has become the first in the country to recognize the existence of caste discrimination in the city's schools. And finally, we look at why Saudi Arabia is seeking security guarantees from the United States before full normalization of its relations with Israel. As the movement against pension reform continues in France, trade unions across the country called for a 48 hours general strike on March 7 and 8 for the first time since 1968. This year, International Working Women's Day actions in France were marked as a tribute to all the workers who will be the first to experience the effects of Macron's pension reform, many of whom are women whose jobs are invisible, careers cut short and salaries inadequate. Anna from People's Health Movement joins us now with latest updates on this story. Thank you for joining us, Anna. Uh, welcome to the show. And uh, first off, the question is that uh, this protest is being considered historic because it's the first time that something like this has happened in the trade action, you know, history in France. So, uh, can you also tell us what were the key demands raised at the protest? Uh, yes. So, uh, of course, uh, the, this uh, this protest actually. Uh, started around the time when uh, the government of President Macron uh, floated the uh, idea of a pension reform uh, which would raise the retirement age in France from 62 to 64 years of age. Uh, and uh, the idea uh, caused uh, a wave of, of protests and of uh, and of uh, opposition by both trade unions but also other people's movements uh, as well as left parties. Uh, now, what you said is right. So it's uh, the the strike that took place from the 7th to the 8th of March is historic in many ways. Uh, first of all, you know, it's uh, it's the first time in France since uh, 1968 when we saw mass uh, mass protests in the country uh, that the trade unions have called for a general 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 strike, which um, lasted for more than a day. So it was a 48 hour, hour strike. Uh, and everybody was uh, was invited to to take part. So that was one uh, one part of it. And then the second part of it is, of course, that it was uh, the first time that uh, the general strike actually covered uh, the 8th of March, so International Working Women's Day. And that's uh, of great importance for the feminist movement because uh, finally we have seen a kind of convergence of, uh, of the overall trade union movement and the feminist group that uh, have worked with the trade union movement and that work within the trade union movement. So... Um, it's uh, this wave of action is also something that's very likely to continue uh, because uh, the pension reform is still being discussed uh, in the French parliament. Uh, and it seems that the government is not really ready to back down. So apparently they're, they're counting on, on support from, uh, for, uh, from uh, right wing uh, parties to, uh, to actually carry through the reform. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, we have heard from trade unions and from uh, from uh, from left politicians over the last days and weeks that they are also not ready to back down. So if uh, if Macron uh, insists on going through with the reform, the trade unions will insist on continuing and actually expanding the action that we are seeing today. Right, and you also mentioned about how uh, this particular general strike is a part of the larger movement against the pension reforms. Uh, since it happened on March 8, which is a significant day, the International Working Women's Day, uh, can you also highlight why uh, some of the demands and what, how, uh, how is the pension reform going to affect the women workers in France in, in terms of, uh, for example, health? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, of course, again, very true. Uh, the trade union, the trade union movement has been very clear from the very beginning of uh, of their actions that women are going to be among the biggest losers of the pension reform if they go through. So, uh, this is because the um, raising the pension age would affect uh, workers in sectors like health and education, where we see more uh, more women. Uh, and who also um, are involved in very difficult work, not only uh, psychologically, and but also physically. So, you know, uh, asking a nurse to work until she's 64 uh, is not uh, not something that, that society should be doing because uh, she it's just something that takes a toll on her own health. Uh, and it's also something that 
has implications for the quality of care that, uh, that the health system is delivering. And of course, the implications for women go much beyond that as well. It's not only about the age until uh, when they are working, but also about the amount that the pensions uh, will uh, will will reach once they're uh, once they're retired. Uh, in France, we're already seeing a gap. Uh, in addition to the gender pay gap, we're also seeing a gender pension gap because women are likely uh, to get lower pensions than men at this point of time as well. And then finally, of course, there's the uh, never-ending uh, load of uh, unpaid care work that women do at home, uh, and which is also you know, not something that's going to decrease if the pension goes through uh, together with other austerity reforms that might impact uh, the social security system in France. So it's something that has very wide implications for for women, uh, and it's uh, it's it's been good to see how many parts of the uh, of the social justice movement have recognized that. So it's not just the feminist movement who has been on the streets on the eighth of March, as you pointed out. It was also the health uh, the health movement, which has been supporting and which has been working with the feminist movement since last year as uh, as well. Uh, so uh, a kind of uh, repetition of what they initiated uh, last 8th of March when they called for an end to austerity, for more investment in public services in France and for uh, for convergence of all these parts of uh, uh, of the social justice movement to uh, to uh, promote the, the rights of women. Right. Thank you so much for joining us today, Anna. Thanks. An important development for the South Asian diaspora in Canada took place as Toronto's school board became the first in Canada to recognize that caste discrimination exists in the city's schools. It has asked a provincial human rights body to help in creating a framework to address the issue. The Toronto District School Board on Wednesday voted in favour of a motion to that effect. In February, Seattle had become the first city in the United States to ban caste discrimination. Earlier today, we spoke to Anish from People's Dispatch for the latest on this story. Yeah, so the Canadian public school uh, system has adopted the resolution uh, after uh, possibly uh, demands from within the Indian community. Obviously, you have an immense uh, level of uh, debate and discussion and discourse happening within the community, uh, which is also important. Uh, uh, but uh, and obviously you also have uh, statements of you know Hindu phobia flying around all the all the over the place. But uh, this is significant in the sense that uh, the caste system or the caste uh, uh, attitudes, uh, let's say, it's not necessarily a system we're talking about, but uh, attitudes and discrimination that and practices of discrimination uh, is quite. Uh, uh, has always been quite, you know, untouched uh, within the North American uh, systems, uh, be it uh, when it comes to legal cases or uh, even, uh, you know, the kind of uh, discrimination that might happen in academic spaces like schools and universities. And uh, despite the significance, uh, the significant uh, presence of, uh, you know, Indian Americans, especially Hindu Americans in these uh, spaces you just do not have that sort of you never really had that level of discourse happening in public space uh, you know on talking about uh, problems within the community that might need to be addressed uh, you know uh, on a systemic level now uh, this uh, resolution definitely uh, puts caste discrimination at par with racial and gender discrimination and that only makes it uh, significant because uh, obviously you, you might have uh, school districts or you know schools where there is a significant number of uh, Indian Americans uh, studying and uh, if you know you have bullying or any other kind of uh, issues happening or violence happening among students or uh, you know uh, within because of the school system and the school board and the students itself you might have, uh, you know, instances of caste discrimination being uh, present, but it, uh, now it gets recognized as a discriminatory practice and that can uh, be, uh, you know, liable to a lawsuit and uh, so on. We have to talk about the history of the diaspora, uh, the Indian diaspora in North America. Obviously, uh, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, you never really had... Uh, 
this issue of caste uh, being discussed because many of them came as workers. Um, and so you had a diversity of people uh, in terms of religion and their caste location. But uh, it is the, you know, the latter part of the uh, immigration uh, from the subcontinent, especially during the 70s, 80s, and 90s, where you also had a rise in, you know, political Hinduism and or what, uh, you know, Indians call Hindutva uh, happening at the same time. And that also being, you know, sort of exported uh, from India to, uh, you know, places like the US and Canada, where you have wealthier uh, better to do Indians, uh, uh, you know, studying in universities, having, you know, uh, uh, decent jobs, uh, uh, like, uh, or, prof or being professionals in different fields, uh, bringing that uh, with, uh, with their, as a cultural asset uh, into, the, into these nations. And um, very often you had uh, pretty much uh, any uh, talk about changing or change or reform or any kind of you know uh, progressive development within the community being completely untouched because obviously these communities dominated uh, the discourse and also demographically within the community. Now recently you have had uh, this new generation of uh, college educated uh, you know students uh, student led movements especially. Uh, that are that is bringing up uh, these progressive points that needs to be addressed, especially caste discrimination, especially in cases where uh, Indian Indian Americans or Hindu Americans are quite a significant uh, population, if not a majority, but like a very significant minority in several universities and in uh, you know academic spaces across this uh, across the continent actually. And uh, in these instances, uh, when you have a new generation of oppressed caste uh, students and other communities and Im new immigrants coming to these cities, these countries, uh, and the uh, kind of discrimination they might face uh, because of their caste location uh, is something that was uh, never really addressed earlier, but now you have it being addressed on a more war footing from within the community. Many of the, uh, we had a similar resolution happening in Seattle where Shama Savant, uh, a socialist, a sort of Trotskyite socialist, but socialist uh, activist who brought up the, the res, uh, was the one who brought up the resolution. She was the only Indian American in the council. The same case happened uh, in Toronto. And you see uh, a significant uh, push from within the community to bring these progressive changes. So what you're seeing is that sort of, you know, these issues of cars and, you know, sectarian hatred that were otherwise uh, never talked about, never touched uh, within the community now being, uh, you know, put out in the open and being scrutinized in the way that it needs to be right now. So this is definitely a step uh, forward in many ways. And finally, in a new development in Israel-Arab relations, Saudi Arabia is seeking security guarantees from the United States in the form of a civilian nuclear program and lesser restrictions on arms sale as it moves closer to officially normalizing relations with Israel. We spoke to Abdul from People's Dispatch on this issue. Welcome to this episode, Abdul. Uh, so, first off, there is a certain push that can be reflected in the terms that Saudi is offering uh, to the United States for this normalization. Can you help us understand what is the objective behind su such kind of a push towards normalization? Well, it, is, uh, it seems that uh, Saudi Arabia is looking for a greater uh, regional role uh, in, uh, in the Arab world and it basically wants to neutralize uh, its uh, uh, larger, uh, uh, you can say, what it perceives as a potential threat from uh, Iran. And that basically uh, is the motivation behind seeking a much more uh, uh, vibrant and much more, uh, you can say, fruitful uh, security guarantee from the United States in case. And it, it seems that um, Saudi Arabia reads uh, uh, that there is a possibility to kind of get that particular uh, security guarantee and the, for example, civilian nuclear uh, deal with uh, US and um, great uh, lesser restrictions on the export of weapons and so on and so forth. At this moment, because US, it seems, is a is much more uh, desperate uh, condition 
to uh, kind of establish a relationship with Saudi Arabia because as we know last few uh, months there has been a kind of a very uh, 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 you can say there was a kind of a, some kind of uncertainty about the relation between uh, about the relationship between Saudi Arabia and US uh, uh, we saw it during the Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia when uh, uh, Biden tried to persuade Saudi Arabia to kind of not cut the overall production of OPEC uh, oil production in OPEC but Saudi Arabia went ahead with it and uh, we saw that how Biden's utterances uh, about uh, making uh, Saudi Arabia a pariah state would have been the reason behind it. So that had led to a, some kind of a distance between Saudi Arabia and US and that was something US did not, uh, uh, does not like to have that kind of particular situation. And so Saudi Arabia sees that desperation and therefore, it also sees that uh, uh, US wants to kind of appease Netanyahu, want to appease uh, Israel in general and uh, 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 relationship with Saudi Arabia, normalization with Saudi Arabia would be a great achievement for Netanyahu at this moment. So, giving all these calculations, it seems Saudi Arabia is looking for much more uh, 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 kind of uh, big ask, uh, in that sense. big share in yeah. the regional politics, and that can only be achieved. It seems that according to their calculation, if US is basically guarantees guarantees much uh, uh, vibrant role in the uh, Saudi Arabia's larger uh, security and geopolitical calculations. Right. And if this proposal comes through, there are implications for, in general, Israel-Arab relations for the entire region. What do you think they can look like? Well, the, uh, it is by and large already established that uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, has a very uh, quote-unquote vibrant relationship, not open but uh, hidden relationship with uh, Israel. A uh, uh, few months back, it allowed the Israeli planes to fly over its uh, is airspace. It has also basically uh, not being very vocal uh, despite the fact that it's uh, on and off does issue statements, formal statements condemning the uh, uptick in viol uh, of violence in uh, occupied territories, mm -hmm. in, uh, in Palestinian territories. Uh, oh, other than that, uh, Saudi Arabia has not been very uh, uh, vocal about the Palestinian cause in last few years. So it is already by and large established that there is a clandestine relationship between Israel and Saudi Arabia. So whether is, uh, Saudi Arabia signs the Abraham Accord uh, like Bahrain and UAE or not, it hardly uh, matters. Um, so overall, uh, the, uh, whether it will have any impact on the larger uh, uh, Arab-Israel uh, relationship or not, formally I don't think there will be any uh, impact, but of course it has some symbolic value for Israel in particular right. uh, is, uh, uh, and uh, Netanyahu uh, also uh, because Netanyahu and Israel has, has tried to argue that uh, they are no more considered to be a, a pariah in the, uh, 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 in the Arab world and uh, the relationship with formal relationship with UAE Bahrain has kind of uh, uh, ma had made it possible to argue on, the, on those lines. And therefore, it is only the uh, Iranians and Iranian back elements uh, in the in the region which are opposed to Israeli uh, existence and uh, uh, are, are talking about uh, basically taking anti-Israeli stance. And uh, Arab world is not uh, uh, with them. Uh, but of course, this this is a false narrative, uh, as we all know. The relationship between Israel and so-called Arab countries is basically a relationship between the Israeli state and the elites in the Arab world. Hmm. Uh, uh, the ruling classes in Bahrain, in UAE and maybe in Saudi Arabia in future, in Egypt for example, they have a good relationship with the Saudi, uh, sorry, for, uh, with the Israelis, but the larger pop population uh, ha has been opposed to uh, Israeli uh, 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 policies vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians and have been opposed to. Uh, any normalization of relationship with Israel. Uh, uh, some of the surveys quoted in the New York piece from which uh, uh, this particular uh, 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 seg uh, point has emerged that Saudi Arabia wants to uh, uh, have uh, normalized the relationship with the US uh, says 
uh, those opinion polls say that more than 75% of the Saudi population is opposed to any kind of normalization with uh, 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 Israel and they are opposed to the entire idea of the Abraham Accord. So the people in the Arab world are still with Palestinian cause. Uh, the ruling classes with whatever their uh, narrow uh, calculation of interest are basically trying to seek closer relationship with the US and Israel becomes a bargaining chip uh, in this entire calculation. Right. Thank you so much for joining us today, Abdul. And that's all we have for today. For more such stories, please visit www.peoplesdispatch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.